Okay, so I'm here today with um, Dr. Pete Thurley, who's a consultant radiologist at the Royal Derby Hospital, and we're going to talk today about interpretation of the abdominal CT scan. So uh, welcome, Pete. Thanks for coming. Hi, John. So what we'll do is look at a few examples of some sort of pathologies you might see as a, as a surgeon on call, and I'll just show you how I approach a CT. Um, the best way, really, I, I find is to be quite systematic, just so you don't miss anything out, just like uh, approaching any other type of imaging. Mm -hmm. um, so when I first get a CT through, obviously exactly what you do depends a bit on the indications, so the clinical information is crucial. But in order not to miss anything, I, I tend to go through in a certain order. So to start with, I'll look at the lung bases. Just, right. so, just, the, so, I mean, so there's a lot of people going to be watching this who haven't really had much experience with CT, so... The black stuff is tends well, it depends how you set the windows, but the black stuff yeah. tends to be air. Yeah, that's right. So, without getting too bogged down in the physics, um, exactly uh, the window you use will depend a bit upon what you're interested in. So, for example, you can see at the bottom of the screen there, you've got some numbers which give you the window width and the window length, a window level rather. Yeah. So, um, the idea being, the way CT works is you have um, information from the machine which gives you a, uh, a value for how much radiation a, a, a voxel, which is like a little cube of, of tissue, absorbs. So air doesn't absorb very much, mm -hmm. whereas bone absorbs a lot. So on this you can see the bone is white and the air is black. Yep. If you wanted to look at the lungs, we'd change the windows so you could get a better view, a better idea of what the lungs uh, uh, look like, and that would, that would be involved. Uh, changing the window level and right. window width, and all these presets are available on all the all the pack systems. Yeah. So we've got it set to an abdominal. Yeah. So so for this one, I would look at the 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 lung uh, the, the lung bases on the lung windows to start with. Once I'm happy, there's nothing major there. I then go through all the solid organs on the on the CT. So start with look at the liver. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is the liver over here. Yeah. So um, I'll have a look at that with the normal abdominal. Uh, windows, which we, we've got the, got on at the moment. I'd also then, if it was say a, a cancer staging scan, I'd probably look at it with liver windows, and that's a special window where any little focal bits in the liver will stand out a bit more. Mm -hmm. And again, those presets are available. So have a good look through there. This is also these are these are axial images, so cross sections, and most CTs give out these these cross sectional images. But you can also get other um, views. So you get, you'll get coronal images, which is as if you're looking from the front. Yeah or sashal image, images, which is if you're looking from the side. I, I find particularly the coronal images are good for looking for at the liver as well, particularly mm. if you've got a little lesion tucked up under the diaphragm, because it can be quite difficult to see on the atrial images, whereas mm. it might be very apparent on the coronals. Mm. So once you look through the liver, I then look at the gallbladder, which is this uh, slightly lower attenuation area here, so slightly darker area, that's it's got fluid and bile in it. Um, the other sort of solid organs you need to review are the adrenals, so these little Mercedes type shapes oh, okay. these, uh, of, of structures here. So those are the are normal looking adrenals. Um, but when there's an adrenal mass, it looks different. Is it is, is yes. a lump there where the little Mercedes things sh should normally be? Yeah, so you'll get you'll get a, a mass lesion. So that yeah. that normal shape is distorted and. A lot of radiology is, is, as you know, is pattern recognition. So yes. it's just a matter of looking at lots and lots of scans and, and you'll get your eye in as, as yeah. to what's normal and abnormal. So these are normal adrenals. Kidneys next. And again, I think coronal images, so looking at it as if you're looking from the front, are really helpful for picking out little adrenal, uh, yeah. little renal lesions. So I'd, I'd go for a, a coronal view of those as well. Next, look for the pancreas. So this is the pancreas here. Um, the tail of the pancreas. This is the this is the body of the pancreas coming around towards the head, and you can see this slightly lower uh, attenuation area in the middle. That's the pancreatic duct. Yep. So we have a look at that for masses. Also look at the, the duct size because an enlarged pancreatic duct can often be um, a secondary sign. You've got a, you've got some pathology going on in the pancreas, so that's mm -hmm. useful. And then last of all, the spleen. This is an arterial phase image. You can tell that because there's lots of contrast in the aorta there and, and the major branches of the aorta. This is the IVC over here, and there's no contrast in there. It's, the images have been acquired quite early yeah. on. So the, the after contrast injection. hasn't circulated and got to the veins yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so for a standard CT abdomen, you might uh, you do it in a, what's called portal venous phase imaging. That's about seventy seconds after injecting the contrast, and this is the portal vein here. Yeah. And on portal venous phase imaging, that'll be full of contrast, and it also just makes liver lesions more conspicuous. Yeah. On the arterial phase imaging, 
of the spleen, you can see it looks a bit blobby and a bit heterogeneous, and that's a normal looking spleen on, on arterial right. phase imaging. Now this patient was uh, sent in with a, a, a suspected ruptured AAA, which is why we did the arterial phase imaging. And as you come down through these slices, you um, you can see the aorta is grossly oh, yeah. abnormal, really dilated. I think this was about a 10 centimeter aneurysm. Yeah. Um, as well as that, you can see there's this little crescent of abnormal tissue outside the lumen of the uh, um, aorta. And some of that is, as you can see at the top there, is the duodenum. But this bit here is, is actually a hematoma. So mm. this is a ruptured aneurysm. So you can see lumen there with contrast in, and then yeah. some thrombus. Yeah, you, you quite often have, well, almost always within within mm. abdominal aortic aneurysms, you'll have areas of thrombus with it. And that, that in itself is, is a normal finding. This mm. has got quite a big flow lumen. You can see all this yeah, contrast yeah, here, is blood big, yeah. flowing through. and. Um, and, but there is stuff outside the yeah. um, the aorta as well. There are various other su secondary signs of um, rupture. So in, you have impending rupture. You'll have the aorta draped over the um, over the vertebral bodies at the back here. So this is this is one of the, the lumbar vertebral yeah. bodies. Um, you can have a, a, an odd morphology to the aneurysm sac. Sometimes you have like beaking, or if you've got calcification in the wall of the aneurysm, which you often have. If you have an interruption of that, that's often a sign you, right. if you've got an impending rupture. But obviously, clinical findings like a yeah. tender aneurysm are, are, are equally significant. So anyway, so we, we're looking at the aorta here because this is a, a scan done in arterial phase, looking for the aorta. You can see the major branches coming off here. So that's the celiac axis there. Mm -hmm. That's the SMA coming off down here. So that's T12 L1. T12 for the celiac axis, L1 for the Yeah, and then SMA. L1, 2, where the uh, the renal artery is tending yeah, off. These, and there's one other side. Yeah, that's right. And they, come, they, they are slightly variable where the renal arteries come off from. They don't always come off at right angles at the side there. There's often, um, you can see accessory renal arteries. I don't think there is an accessory in this case, yeah. but they're always worth looking for. Um, and also important if you're planning some sort of intervention for, for this kind of thing. Yeah, so we, if you, most of these get stented now and... You want to know where the renals are because if you put the stent across the renals, that's bad news. And you can put stents down the renals or in court, you know, have little slits for the renals, but you yeah. need to know beforehand. So. Yeah, and generally for, uh, for emergency ones, they, they, some centres will, will treat uh, aneurysms yeah. with, with, with um, stents into the visceral arteries, generally for, for ruptures in the acute setting because yeah. you don't have uh, time to, to get a special graft. You, you need to make sure you've got a neck beneath the renals to, to shove your graft and we, in. And we have in this one. So... For this patient, we know the diagnosis. If we were just approaching it and we hadn't seen anything else abnormal, our next step would be to look in the retroperitoneum around the aorta, looking for nodal disease, and tend to go all the way down the aorta and also then down both iliacs, looking for the um, looking for any nodal disease or anything abnormal along there. In this case, uh, we already know the diagnosis, and, and that's that's less less relevant. Mm -hmm. Once I've looked at the nodes, I'll I'll look at the colon. And the colon is quite tricky to assess on a, on a standard CT because you, you often have faeces in the colon that can mimic tumours. This patient's got a bit of diverticular disease mm. there, you can see. Um, so there's lots of little, it's quite a little bit thickened. Yeah. And some air pouching. Yeah. These are little diverticular, yeah. and the, the thickening is related to the sort of smooth muscle hypertrophy yeah. Yeah. as part of the disease process. Um, but it's always worth looking at the colon because although you will miss subtle things because of the faeces and it's not dilated. You can occasionally pick up very large masses, which yeah. um, which are obviously significant. So once you've done that, I will have a little look at the small bowel to make sure there's no small bowel dilatation, which there isn't in this case. Mm -hmm. And then can you just point to a bit of small bowel? So these loops of small bowel up here, mm -hmm. you, can, you can follow it around from the uh, this is the stomach coming down into the proximal duodenum. Mm -hmm. The in this patient, the um, the duodenum stretched across the aneurysm before it gets to the DJ flexure. Um, mm -hmm. And you can see more pelvic loops of small bowel lower down. So, mm. other way. So all these are loops of small bowel which are, which are collapsed, and, and that, that's that's normal appearances of a, of a small bowel on the mm. CT. And if you're looking at that specifically, you have some oral contrast. Yeah. So if, if you if you're particularly looking for small bowel um, pathology, there are, there are various um, ways of, of of investigating that. You can give um, oral contrast for CT, and if you get good. Bowel, um, small bowel extension, you can get really nice pictures for the CT. So last of all, after I've looked at all the bowel and the, the nodes, I, I then go back and look for destructive bony lesions. And again, sagittal and coronal views, so side on and front on views are really nice for looking at the vertebral bodies. In particular, that'll show you if there's any wedge fractures or anything like that. And obviously we'd also change our windows to a uh, bony windows, which, mm -hmm. which show that the, the bones are a, a bit more nicely. So these are some um, coronal views of the same patient. 
So this is if we're looking from the front. You can you can see how you can appreciate the vertebral body oh, height. The kidneys look nicely. Uh, really different, don't they? Yeah, so you get a much a better overview of the kidneys. And then looking at things in more than one plane, you're more likely to pick, pick up such little masses. So it's yeah. really helpful. And the other thing, as I was saying earlier, if you look at the, the liver, especially here, just under the heart, where there's not really much liver tissue and you can get sort of partial volume artifact because it's so thin, looking at it in a different um, plane often is really, really helpful. I tend to review most CTs with, with cranial images, so they're particularly helpful for looking at the bones, mm -hmm. um, but also for the solid viscera, I think. Um, and also, if you, if you see something on an axial slice and you think, well, that looks a bit odd, but I'm not sure exactly what it is or if it's normal or not, you could then go and uh, interrogate on a different, different plane and, and it can often be really, really helpful. Mm. The other thing with CTs of the abdomen, if, you, if you're a surgeon, is you want to know if there's any free fluid or, or free air. So once I've looked, looked, through it, looked through everything, I'd change it to bone windows and look, look through on axial and coronal images looking for free air because that will really stand out. Right. You look for free and that stands up, it's very, very black. Yeah, so that'd be completely yeah. black on all windows, no yeah. matter how you winder it, and, and, and they'll, they'll be much more apparent on the, on the bone windows or lung windows. Mm. Um, and free fluid, again, is an important thing to look for. It tends to sort of occur in predictable places, so checking the pelvis, especially behind the, especially behind the bladder, looking for free fluid, mm -hmm. and also around the spleen and the liver, you can often have a little rind of free fluid there, mm. so that's that's And that looks for. It's a slightly greyer, lower attenuation thing. Yeah, see that. yeah, so it's sort of... It, Similar attenuation to the gallbladder there, so, yeah. so lower attenuation to the to the viscera and yeah. also to your muscles, but but slightly uh, brighter than the fat, which is which is very dark, but not quite as dark as the air, mm -hmm. as we've said. So you've been you've been going so looking at a CT. So we've, we've got a system now for checking things. You've been going sort of up and down, back as well as kind of making your own video from these from these individual screens. Is that is that the way to do it? It's just not not one image, but go up and down? I, th I think when you first start looking at this, it's important just to go through one image at a time, look at it all really carefully. Yeah. But as I was saying before, so much of radiology is pattern recognition mm -hmm. and just looking at things over and over again. And you'll find that as you get more experience in looking at them, things will just jump out while you're, while you're, just, while you're just scrolling through because it'll just, it'll just stand out something you don't normally see and, and so that that's quite a useful way of doing it. So let's say you're a you're, you're a medical student or foundation doctor or core trainee on call or in the clinic. How how are you gonna get good at these? What what would you what do you say you need to do? It, it is just a matter of looking at lots and lots. Yeah. Um, with the, with the report afterwards, so you see what you saw and yeah, I think if you get the clinical information and you know the question you want to know the answer to, you, you can then focus what you look at and then you can check your findings with with the report. The other thing is most you know most images are reviewed in MDT, so MDT is a quite useful way mm. to go and, and pick up a, a lot of knowledge. I think mm. um, from from uh, sort of all, all the specialties, you, you'll pick up gems from that. And the other thing is. Um, you know, if you, if you have an interesting scan, take it to your local radiologist. They'll they, hopefully they'll be happy to look at it with you and, and talk yeah. you through it and answer yeah. any questions. And and certainly, if you've if you've got an interesting case, they'll they'll probably be quite keen. Yeah, no, I always I always find that a great help. So we've had a look at a patient with uh, ruptured aneurysm. Um, this is another patient who uh, was admitted under the surgical team. Um, so how so you you get a request? How important is the information on the request? It. Radiologists always going on about how we like clinical information, but it, it is critical in terms of you will tailor the type of scan depending on what the, the, the question is. I mean, that's, that's critical. When, you, when you're asking for a scan, what we want to know is what is the question you need answering. And we, we sort of touched on this a bit in terms of having special preparation for the bowel. Yeah. But say we were worried about um, bowel ischemia or some arterial problem, then we'd definitely include an arterial phase on the, the scan, so say uh, if you're worried about GI bleeding, for example, you'd, you'd certainly include um, an arterial phase in the scan. Whereas, so, so timing the intravenous contrast is, is a big thing. Sometimes you don't need intravenous contrast. For example, if you're looking for renal stones, having the bright renal, renal stone as, as um, on the background of an unenhanced kidney is very easy to see. Mm. Whereas if you contrast, it can actually paradoxically make it more difficult to make the yeah. right diagnosis. So it, it is absolutely critical. So you're not just being grumpy, it actually makes it to what you do and then the result you get in treating the patient. So Some of the times we're not being grumpy. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> that's only some of the time. So this patient was someone who came in with, with abdominal pain. The question mark was whether the patient was obstructed. So as before, we start with the lung windows, looking at the lung bases, um, go through and um, look at the liver there. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you can see the, the gallbladder there. 
Yeah, that's a bit more distended. So that's probably because the patient's fasted mm -hmm. and they're not eaten. The rest of the solid viscera look pretty normal again. We've looked at the adrenals, the kidneys, the pancreas, the spleen there. Is, is there something extra? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your, your equal eyes have already picked out the abnormality here. So this is a, a great example of a patient with um, some bowel pathology. So this is the uh, ileum coming down towards the ileus equal valve. Yeah. And as it passes up, you can see this very abnormal looking bit of bowel. And you can see this cuff of fat around the, um, the small bowel as, it, as it's going into the, um, into the colon. This is a patient with uh, interception. So you've got the bowel being pulled through um, within, the, within the large bowel yeah. with this fluid and fat around the outside. And this was a patient who had a um, malignant lesion uh, near their ileus equal valve who, who was presenting with, um, with interception. Mm. But then it's really important to carry on going through the system. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's this uh, expression called satisfaction of search. And it's when you're looking at some radiological test, you see an abnormality and you immediately feel triumphant and switch off because it's like, right, I've spotted what's wrong. I can now relax my job's done. Yeah. But actually, particularly for something like this, you need to then look around and see what else is going on. So, you know, for example, it's really, it'd be really useful to know whether there's been a perforation. So you'd look carefully for free air. Mm -hmm. um, this is a malignant lesion. So you want to make sure there's no metastasis. So mm -hmm. you, you can see there's a few little nodes here in the mesentery, these little white blobs mm -hmm. here, uh, lymph nodes. Um, but it's very important to then go and look at the um, the bones, make sure you've got bony metastasis, mm -hmm. um, and go and um, you probably want to do a CT scan with their chest to, com to complete the staging. So, but a really careful look through that. <laughs> so it's important not to get carried away and and just just relax as soon as you spot one abnormality. You need to still kind of keep your system mm -hmm. and make sure you go through things really systematically. So these are the cranial images. So again, you're looking as if you're looking face to face with the patients. Um, and that's quite nice because you can see the bowel going up with the fat either side of it, yeah. intercepting into the... Uh, you can see the, the loop, really quite nice, can't you? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, um, it's quite useful. You can see the appendix it's poking out around the side there. That's yeah. the appendix being sucked yeah. into the... Oh, you can see that, to, just to, that turn line, is it? Yeah, that's right, yeah. You see it going in there, that's, that's really, really quite something. And... Again, quick look at the liver there just to make sure there's no metastasis, especially in that left leg there, mm. where it's a bit tricky to see. But, yeah. And the small bowel looks a little bit more blown up on there. Yeah, there are a few loops, aren't there? Yeah. They look quite prominent yeah. there, so uh, maybe they are sort of intimately obstructing, which wouldn't be surprising really, yeah. given what that looks like. So this is a patient um, who uh, came in with acute pancreatitis and wasn't very well. Um, a lot of abdominal pain, obviously, but also the drop in the haemoglobin. So we did a CT scan, and there are obviously lots of different types of complication of, of pancreatitis you can see on on uh, CT. You can look for biliary dilatation. You can look for pancreatic necrosis, um, pseudocysts, other collections, inflammatory masses, that kind of thing. The other important thing to look for is vascular complications. So. In this patient, it's quite nice because you can see the splenic vein really clearly, especially on these um, uh, coronal images. So that's the splenic vein going out towards the splenic hilum there. Mm -hmm. And you can see it coming over to the midline here where it joins with the uh, superior mesenteric vein to make the portal vein going up there. Yeah. Um, those are the kidneys there. And this one, as I say, you'd start with the lungs, and there's, there's something to see in the lungs here. You can see this is an air bronchogram here, and you've got bit of fluid at the at the base yeah. there, the left lung base, with a bit of associated consolidation. Again, you know, with the inflammation you get with pancreatitis, you mm -hmm. often get changes in the lungs. There's more consolidation there on the left and the right. Um, liver looks okay. You'd, you'd be worried about um, some uh, biliary dilatation. You can see that's the CBD there, maybe a tiny bit plump, but not significantly dilated. Mm -hmm. And importantly, there's not really much in the way of intrahepatic duct dilatation. You can just about make up the right side of ducts there, running next to the portal vein mm -hmm. branches. And the same on the left there, you can just about make out some small intrahepatic ducts, but they're, but they're normal. No liver lesions. Mm -hmm. We've looked at the adrenals, they're fine. Kidneys look all right. Spleen there. Occasionally get splenic infarcts and things, but that looks okay again. So this is the pancreas. Mm -hmm. And you can see around the pancreas, there's loads of stranding um, in keeping with the pancreatitis. You can see that the pancreas itself is enhancing mm -hmm. uh, normally, so that's... Um, so that's good. Can't see any evidence of pancreatic necrosis. So if it's, ne if it's necrotic, it doesn't get a blood supply. 
and so it doesn't light up when you put the contrast in. Exactly, yeah, and, and again, that's when timing's critical, because you want to give the contrast when the pancreas is going to be at its, its peak enhancement, yeah. which is arterial phase, yeah. maybe a bit later, about 45 seconds. Um, so yeah, you look for bit, bits of the pancreas where there's, there's gaps of, of, of the normal tissue. You see the pancreatic ducts normally, although that's not at all dilated, so that's normal. Yeah. If you had a patient with chronic pancreatitis, you'd be looking for, for those sort of changes too. So that would be things like pancreatic uh, parenchymal calcifications or a dilated ectatic duct and, and an ectatic side ducts. And sometimes you get very atrophic pancreases if, you, if you've had a, a lot of pancreatitis. This patient's got another vascular complication though that you sometimes see with, with pancreatitis. And that's uh, a pseudoaneurysm. So a pseudoaneurysm is basically when you have a defect in the, uh, in, the, in the wall of an artery and you have a contained leak effectively mm. and that happens in pancreatitis because you get all the nasty pancreatic enzymes um, released and they, and they sort of bathe the vessels and there's lots of blood vessels around the pancreas there's a rich blood supply coming from the SMA and, and the celiac axis mm. and this patient has got this big blob here you can see that's the same kind of um, attenuation as the blood vessels so this is contrast that's just been injected sitting in a little pseudoaneurysm and around that you can see all this stuff here and this is hematoma this is this is blood mm. so blood on a ct again it's a, a bit bit brighter than um the normal fluid um normally about 60 to 80 hounsfield units for you yeah to measure. look it up on wikipedia there's a good page on wikipedia at hounsfield units yeah um very very briefly hounsfield units is, is a measure of attenuation um, zero is, is the, the number assigned to it, so anything that's fluid intensity, mm. anything like um, bone will be several hundreds, and air is minus mm. several hundreds, and, and everything else is in between. And he, he was from not too far from there, I think, Huntsfield. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So, um, yep, yeah, so this is a pseudoaneurysm, big hematome around it, there's some blood in the bowel as well, and this is someone with, 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 with uh, pancreatitis. We're talking about uh, earlier a bit a bit about free fluid and this is quite a nice example of free fluid in the pelvis here you can see these are loops of bowel these slightly brighter bits and in between it this this uh, irregular low attenuation stuff is, mm. is fluid maybe a bit of blood mixed in with that and that, that's the same the shade of grey as the other blood you saw before or pretty close to it well this this bit here is hematoma yeah that bit there which is similar to the blood in and around the duodenum yeah this dark stuff is, is just free fluid you can see the difference there and that that dark stuff is much more Similar to right. um, the, so the there's liquid there. blood and hematoma. Yeah, right. yeah, and, and and completely fresh blood that hasn't clotted will be yeah. slightly darker yeah. than, than 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 clotted blood, which you can see the stuff in the left side of the abdomen is. Okay, that's great. So, well, thanks. We, we've seen some really interesting scans. Just take us through your your method for looking at any CT. So, first of all, read the clinical information very carefully because. Um, that's often a good pointer as to the question you're on, you need to answer. Then if you're just going through a standard abdominal CT, there, there, are, uh, there, there is a clear system to, to go through. So personally, I start with a, with a lung basis so I don't forget them. Put lung windows and go through making sure there are no big lung masses or consolidation or, or pleural effusions. Next, I move on to the abdomen and look at the solid organs, so in particular the liver. Then I look at the gallbladder, adrenals, kidneys, pancreas and spleen, carefully looking for any focal lesions, any, any masses, and looking on the coronal images as well as the axial images, I think is key for those. Once done that, I move to the retroperitoneum, and we'll go down and look for paraortic lymph nodes, then also look in the pelvis to make sure there are no lymph nodes next to the ileic vessels, which is where you commonly see them. Once done that, I'll go through the colon, and that... Sometimes it takes a bit of doing, going up and down, it can be quite wiggly, but you need to follow that all the way around, making sure there aren't any large masses there. You, you have to accept the limitations of CT, and you will miss, you'll certainly miss small polyps, you may even miss small, small malignancies um, if there's a lot of feces or the bowel's collapsed, but have a look anyway. Um, and then look for small bowel, looking for small bowel dilatation in particular. If you do see that and you're worried about small bowel obstruction, you need then to follow the small bowel around looking for where there's a change in um, the calibre to look for the transition point and the cause of the small bowel obstruction. Once done that, I'll look at the bones and change the bony windows and look at it in multiple planes, particularly sagittal and coronal planes for the bones. Um, and again, with acute abdomens, it's very important then to look through for free air and whilst you're doing that, you can look for some free fluid in the pelvis and, and, and around the uh, liver and spleen. There are other little things you might want to do depending on the clinical information. So 
Certainly if you've got a history which might suggest bleeding or might suggest ischemia, you'd look very carefully at all the blood vessels. Um, and that, as well as the arteries, that includes the, the veins. Sometimes, you know, patients with SMV thrombosis can, can present with, with abdominal pain. Mm. So the vessels are something else to look at. But again, you will slightly tailor what you do depending on exactly the question you need to answer. Great. Well, Pete Thurley, thank you very much indeed. No problem.